Good morning. I want to welcome everyone participating in this morning's webinar. <clears throat> My name is Yevgeny Suhenko, and I'm a supervisor in the Outsourced Accounting Department at Gelman, Rosenberg, and Friedman, and I'll be today's moderator. I'd like to start off today with some quick housekeeping items and explain what participants need to do to earn CPE credit for today's webinar. For the best sound quality, we highly recommend that you connect by phone instead of your computer. If you have any technical questions or issues during the webinar, please use the questions function to speak with our webinar administrator for assistance. Please note that this webinar will be recorded and made available on our website following the event. The slides will also be posted at the address shown here, which is www.grfcpa.com slash webinars. Webinar participants seeking CPE credit for this presentation must complete and submit a short evaluation survey that will appear automatically immediately following the webinar. Please write down the CPE words when they're given as they will not be provided again. You will be asked to recall these words in order to receive CPE credit. If you have an active pop-up blocker, please take a moment and disable it now so that it does not block the survey. Any technical questions about the survey may be addressed to Dominic Acosta at dacosta at grfcpa.com. As the title of today's webinar implies, today's learning objective is to provide attendees with a better understanding of cost accounting standards. One and a half CPE credits are made available to attendees of today's webinar. With all that said, welcome to today's webinar, Understanding the Cost Accounting Standards. This is the final installment of our five-part GovCon webinar series co-hosted with SIMPAC. So with that, today's speakers will be Paul Calabres, who is a principal with Gelman, Rosenberg, and Friedman's Outsourced Accounting and Advisory Services Group. Mr. Calabres brings a successful track record of working with both nonprofits and government contractors. His remarkable career includes positions with the Air Force Audit Agency, DCAA, and three government contractors, in addition to his 20 plus years in public accounting. Chris Brown is the president of Aldebaran and has 25 years of experience with the development and promotion of the Simpac software product lines. He has personally helped hundreds of government contractors achieve compliance, with the use of cost accounting software that is purpose built for the government contracting industry. And finally, Steve Shamlian is the founder of Government Contract Compliance Management LLC a firm dedicated to providing high-level government contract accounting and pricing services to mid-market and emerging government contractors. Steve has over 30 years of experience serving government contractors of all size in a wide variety of industries. Steve's experience has come from his work in government, specifically with the DCAA, industry, and consulting. And so before we dive into our presentation, we want to go over our first polling question. And it is, is it more important to first have a CAS compliant system or a FAR compliant accounting system? And the answers are CAS compliant, B, FAR compliant, C, both, or D, I'm not really sure, I'm pretty new to this. So please take a moment now to answer. While participants are recording their answers, I'll provide the first CPE word. The first CPE word for today's webinar is system, S-Y-S. T E M. Remember, if you want to receive CPE credit, please jot these words down as you will need them for the survey following the webinar. Again, our first CPE word is system, S-Y-S-T-E-M. Hi, this is Paul Calabrese. Um, it looks like everybody chose FAR compliant, or a good part of you did, and that's the answer. Um, before we establish any kind of system, we need to be FAR compliant first. We need to follow the FAR. In fact, many of the CAS standards are included in the FAR. So we just wanted to bring this to your attention. Thank you. So we're going to start basically with the beginnings of just understanding the basics of CAS, the cost accounting standards. We're not here today to make something so complicated you cannot understand. And probably the most important thing about CAS is just what are the thresholds 
what are the exemptions, and basically how it works. So we'll talk about its applicability and the significance of the thresholds and the applications of the thresholds. The purpose of the CAS is really to make things uniform and consistent among all the government contractors that have these awards. It's also available for institutes of higher education. They have their own set but primarily it's for government negotiated contracts and subcontracts. So even if you got a subcontract, you got to find out in that prime contract, is it, you know, negotiated is the term. And of course, negotiation is a term of art, but you can find it on the face of the term sheet of the award. And it will tell you whether it's negotiated or not. And the basic premise of it is assignment, measurement and allocation assignment to a specific year, which follows the matching and accrual principle that all of the accountants know about. But measurement gets into something else. And when you get into um, insurance costs like self-insurance or you deal with pension and you'll need actual aerials, actuarials to, <laughs> I have a hard time pronouncing it, um, to help you measure the cost in that year. And then of course, allocability as we've all dealt with, you know, can it be directly assigned to a direct cost? Is there some causal benefit relationship that you can apply these intermediate cost accounting, um, these costs of like a cost center, or is it just stuck in, in the indirect because it's management costs? Like we hear of this three factor formula for home office allocation. Those are the kinds of things that CAS really deals with. And the standards have been so good that although there are 20, there are only 19 standards and they really haven't changed much except for thresholds and a few other items. But pretty much the gentleman that put this together has stayed with us for many, many years. It goes back to the 1970s. So it's a prerequisite to contracting that you disclose your accounting practices. You may realize that, or maybe you haven't, that when you submit proposals to the United States government under the FAR, you know, they ask you, is this proposal consistent with your disclosed accounting standards? Well, the idea here is that um, this will be more consistent. And if you reach a certain threshold of over 50 million, either with one or prior years, in the prior year, 50 million negotiated contracts, then you have to have what's a cash disclosure statement. And if you don't follow the rules, then you're kind of agreeing to a downward reduction in price for not complying. So, and there's what we call an established cost accounting practice, which Steve will talk about later. And it seems straightforward, but it's so easy for different interpretations. Okay, and we can see some of the main exemptions from CAS. If you have a sealed bid, an IFB, invitation for bid, fixed lump sum, that's definitely gonna be exempt from CAS. Um, and then the, the bigger ones are it being awarded less than 750,000, which we'll go into in a minute, and small business is obviously the biggest the biggest exemption from CAS. One of the ones that are more interesting is um, firm fixed price with price competition where there's no cost of pricing data. So this is where the CAS is now finally on parity with um, negotiated contracts that have cost of pricing data and have to sign a certificate of current cost of pricing data. It sounds re repetitive, but that is a requirement, then that type of fixed price will be subject to CAS. And the basic threshold to start it all is at 7.5 million. That's why it says if it's less than 7.5 million. But just to input and kind of summarize a bit, you'll notice that most of the exemptions relate to prices that are not determined based on cost. 
So why have something a regulation that applies to cost if the cost is not uh, not based? If I'm sorry, uh, why have a rate uh, a contract subject to a regulation uh, over cost if the price of the contract is not uh, based on cost? If based on some other factor like like commerciality or um, uh, competitiveness. And then the other exemptions are more government policy. Sorry, I forgot to put on my mute button. Um, so the exemption from CAS, again, the thresholds are 750000 and it's based on the price or costing data that you have um, from a negotiated procurement um, that requires cost of pricing certificate. And it's the same as the same level as exemption to the gas coverage. So you're trying to make things have parity and have the regulations work together. It took a number of years to get this to work. And we're so glad they finally got the threshold and it goes up every few years. So basically what we're saying is if you have a contract that's less than 7.5 million, you're not going to have any cast coverage. And this is where we first get into how to explain to someone that the trigger contract is 7.5 million. Okay. And then after that, as long as if you can kind of see horizontal lines in your mind, imagine a horizontal line of 7.5 million over two years. If you have another cash cover contract within that two years that is awarded at least at the $750,000 threshold, you continue to have the cash coverage. If not, there'll be a break in cash coverage and you have to start over. So, um, and as you can see in the definition, Provided at the time of the award, the business unit, the contractor, subcontractor is not currently performing. So there is a definition as to what is currently performing as well. Steve, you want to chime in? No, I think you covered that pretty well. <laughs> Just a comment that I have is, uh, you know, sometimes uh, I get the question of, well, I'm not cast covered because I don't have a $50 million award. So my company is not cast covered. Well, the distinction is your company is never cast covered per se. It's the contract that is cast covered, not the company. Proceed. You know, Chris, you came up with probably the crux of our whole presentation. And Chris is an IT guy or software guy. I was a software guy, not an IT guy. And that is exactly the answer is that this is by contract, by contract, by contract. And it's a very astute uh, observation. The definition of currently performing, um, as you can see below, is a contractor has been awarded a contract, but has not yet received notification of final acceptance of all supply services data deliverable under a contract, including options. So really until you finally close this, this thing out, um, or at least a notification like the old DD form 250, you know, you've submitted it, you've got some final exception of supplies or services. So closeout is an important part of this process, right, Steve? Absolutely. So if you're, uh, if the government is not closing out your contracts on a timely basis, it might subject uh, other contracts to cash coverage that uh, would have otherwise been exempt. So it's up to the contractors to really push contract closeouts. A lot of good things happen to the contractor uh, when the contract is closed out. So, so. And the most important is you can move on. Finally, things you've signed your assignments. Um, that's one of them and some of the other release forms. And so you're out of that whole process. Um, so it is important to keep track of your contracts and close them out. Sorry, one, one too quick. So the initial trigger, although they say it's 750,000, really it's 7.5 million with a 750,000 overlap. And again, as long as you see the 750,000 as a minimum, um, 
supporting that negotiated contract of 7.5 where it's under another contract, you'll always be cash covered. But the minute there's a break, you know, then there's a break. And um, that's how it works. So the smaller entities that kind of ebb and flow into this, this can be a real pain to manage. And we'll talk about how to manage that later. DCAA in their um, contract, um, let's see, contract uh, or audit manual. Um, in there, they have also this picture, this flow chart. We had to update the amount because the last version um, to 750,000 in this block up here. But this gives you kind of a flow chart of how it goes through. Yes, no, am I exempt or not exempt? and so forth. And on the next page, um, they go through all the things that get into whether you're modified CAS, full CAS coverage, and then are you subject to a, a CAS disclosure statement. It's not an easy thing. It's, it's hard to diagram. It's hard to, to show this stuff, um, but it's probably the best thing out there. So what are the significance of these cash thresholds? And this is where um, possibly you get into cost impacts issues and so forth. As, as Chris rightly said, it's not your business, it's your contract that's exempt from cash or can be modified or full cash coverage. So you're measuring the potential value um, of applicable modified or full cash coverage because exempt obviously would be exempt and you compute from the point of the non-compliance or change to the end of the contract. And you determine the impact on the lowest level, which is a business unit level basis, not, not really having a home office. It's all integrated as one unit. And uh, of course your status could change depending upon your level of involvement from year to year. So it's uh, important to define what a business unit is. Most of the smaller entities are just one business unit, means any segment of an organization or entire business organization, which is not divided into segments. So we got to define what a segment is, and that's one or two or more divisions, product departments, plants, subdivisions for an organization reporting to something we call a home office. And then it starts to get a little bit more complicated. Something to point out uh, with regard to business units is the contractor has a wide latitude as to what uh, what he considers a business unit. Um, the only regulatory uh, requirement that a business unit have is that it has its own business unit GNA. But other than that, a company can divide itself or not divide itself any way it sees fit. And sometimes we call it a local GNA. So we get into the CAS coverages. We've already know what is exempt. What gets us into it if it's a neg negotiated contract? Well, um, modified is one of those. And that means in the prior year, you received less than 50 million in, the, in net negotiated awards. Um, or in the current year, um, no one contract was greater than 50 million, but you at least had that 7.5 million trigger that got you into cash cover. And there's only four standards that really go along with this, and that's CAS 401, 402, 405, and 406. And so um, those are the four CAS standards. Side note on those, you know, 401, 402, they have to do with consistency. 401 is consistency, estimating, uh, and reporting your cost. Uh, 405, that dovetails nicely into FAR 31. There's a lot of cross references in the FAR and the cost accounting standards. So 405 in particular is, uh, is the concept of unallowable expenses, unallowable costs. And 406 uh, is your cost accounting period, which is effectively uh, the uh, CAS equivalent of the matching principle. Awesome, Chris. Thank you.
Thanks, guys. So we're now on our second polling question. And our question is, what happens to an exempt contract from CAS if the business unit is either modified CAS or full CAS? And the answer choices are, A, the contract can only be modified CAS, B, the contract can only be full CAS, C, the contract remains exempt from CAS, or D, again, I'm just not sure, I'm pretty new to this. So please take a moment now to answer while everybody is recording their answer. Word. The second CPE word is contract, C-O-N-T-R-A-C-T. If you want to receive CPE credit, please jot these words down because you will need them for our survey following the webinar. Again, the second CPE word is contract, C-O-N-T-R-A-C-T. Okay. So it looks like uh, most of you got the correct answer. The contract remains exempt from CAS. It keeps its, its uh, attributes. So like if you're a small business and you're exempt from CAS, just because you, you, know, you can't have that CAS change its nature, it wouldn't be fair, wouldn't be appropriate. So as you transition in and out of this, you can have a variety of situations, a variety of complexity, and it's something to think about. Okay. So if one contract is awarded as modified, um, and um, therefore the, the items, the contracts in that business unit will be modified coverage. Again, it is contract by contract but it's kind of like the business unit is, let's say uh, you have an ice cream cone, you're now throwing sprinkles on it. Well, the first set of sprinkles that are being thrown on there is modified gas coverage. You have an ice cream cone and it's, it's gas covered, but now there's another process that's thrown on it. And every ice cream cone you have in that year, as long as it's modified gas coverage, will have, let's say the red sprinkles. And it would of course be the same for full gas coverage. If all of a sudden you're now full cast covered, then let's say instead of uh, red, it now goes to blue. You know, that's the way this thing kind of works. It's, it's three dimensional. And so sometimes we have a hard time defining and explaining to you exactly how this works. So um, obviously the exception to this is again, if you get more than 50 million, then it's full cast coverage or you have one single a uh, contract that's over 50 million in all its potential value or in the previous year. So there's a lot of things that can happen. Uh, you guys want to chime in? Ice cream cones. Sprinkles. <laughs> making me hungry. But, but uh, you rightly point out that the contract retains its nature throughout the life of the contract. If, if, Think of it as you signed up for a certain set of circumstances and uh, one party to the contract can't change those circumstances uh, uh, requirements uh, to the other party uh, to the contract without both parties agreeing to it. And uh, so, so if I signed up for modified CAS on this contract, I'm not going to get any different coverage just because some other business uh, – uh, situations have changed. Go ahead, Paul. Okay. So the principle, as we keep rehearsing, it's almost like we know what we're going to say. The principle regarding gas coverage, once the contract is modified, it keeps its same nature and will not change regardless of whatever happens within that business unit regarding subsequent accounting periods or even during a period where you could be modified CAS and all of a sudden you get this one large full CAS coverage. So lots of things can go on and that's why you have to be aware of it. And you really need like a list, you know, to keep track of all this stuff. And it's very, very important. Do I see many contractors do this? No. I'm sure with the large ones like that uh, Steve worked with, with Litton, they probably did. 
but some organizations really, they need to brief their contracts. I can't stress this and say, ah, we don't need to do it. You know, DC didn't really check for it. You're hurting yourself because you've got to know yourself. What are the contract specific requirements? And one of the biggest thing is it not CAS, is it CAS modified or CAS full coverage? So something the DCAA does when reviewing contracts for uh, CAS coverage, it just looks to see if the CAS clause is there. But the CAS clause is self-deleting. The first phrase in the first sentence of the CAS clause is unless one of the exemptions applies and goes on to say then, then this contract is CAS covered. And you know, when the contract is awarded, the contractor provides uh, uh, certain representations, including what level of CAS coverage this contract is going to be. And while the contractor is still thinking about that and the documents are still there, it's a good idea to record what, whether that contract is exempt from CAS and why, or modified coverage or, and why, or, or full coverage and why. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about application of CAS thresholds. And here we go. The importance of having and identifying contracts with a CAS clause and having a tracking system. Very, very important. And I believe that would be part of your, again, the briefing of the contracts and all the specifications in the contracts. And if you have ever dealt with an ICE form, it's like supplemental O. I don't know why it's supplemental O, but now it used to be S as in Sam. But the contract brief form, if you don't have a copy of it, we can certainly send you one. And it really does track a lot of important information. If you're primarily fixed price and you're not in the cost world, then you know this may not be as important. And it also talks about what is net awards, the total value of a negotiated cash contract prime. Subaward, including the potential value of a contract options received during the reporting period, minus cancellations, terminations, and other credit transactions. So what this is saying is at the time that you get this award, you know, if they say it's going to be a five-year award and you priced it out for five years, then that's the value it's going to be. It's not the first year. It's all the ones. And so we're going to give this question to our most esteemed Steve here and say, what do you do with an IDIQ that has a minimum value of 100,000? How do you do that with a negotiated contract? And that's an excellent question. And that's going to, and that's something where there's not really clear guidance. If you talk to DCAA, they'll uh, say, okay, you've got a, multi, uh, a multiple award IDIQ contract with a maximum value of in excess of $50 million and a minimum value of, uh, of $1,500. So is that cast covered or not? And DCAA would say, well, the maximum value is $50 million. Um, so it is. I'm not sure that that makes sense. Um, if it was a single award IDIQ, okay, I, I'm, I'm starting to see that that's, that's probably a little more sensible, but for a multiple award, I, I don't see the sense in that. And, uh, and I also don't see good guidance that would, uh, um, you know, that that would answer the question. I think this is probably either going to have to be uh, addressed by the CAS board or uh, or be litigated. Good point. Yeah, if you have an omnibus, for example, and everybody in this brother is bidding on this thing, like the Seaport E type, NAF C type. You know, ha, you know, there's no way if they give you a minimum maximum value that you can establish anything. So I think Steve is absolutely correct. And, you know, we thought at one time the cash board would actually deal with this. And they don't always deal with the things that people need to do that would avoid a lot of conflict, unfortunately. Back in the day, you had uh, contracts that were uh, a, a base year at plus four option years yeah. and and that was pretty straightforward and the cast board was you know thinking in those terms 
And I don't think they had IDIQ contracts back in the day. But now they do, and they don't have uh, regulation that uh, that fully addresses it. So if I get a, um, if I'm part of a team that wins a billion dollar IDIQ contract, mm -hmm. and I'm, it's it's unclear to me how much of that contract to be awarded to me. Mm -hmm. There's no guidance as to whether or not I have to say, oh, it's it's well over that fifty million dollar yeah. threshold. I'm I'm covered. That, and that and all you covered. get, and all you get out of that billion dollar award is the fifteen hundred dollar minimum. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. And you didn't uh, consistently follow your cost accounting practices, so there could be a cost impact of that fifteen hundred dollar contract. Yeah, according to DCA, and that just that just doesn't make sense to me, huh? Yeah, not at all. So, so I think there's some work for the cast board to do there. Take it away, Paul. Okay, cast for 18 is a requirement of full cast coverage, and it basically deals with consistency in direct charging and indirect charging. And as you get a little bit more complicated and sophisticated, you can have some direct charge items if they're of an immaterial amount that are indirect. Now you could have, in thinking of full cast coverage, you could have multiple entities, multiple affiliates, uh, multiple segments under a home office. And often these companies, they were once separate, were acquired together and often not consistent. And I'm sure that CAS 418 was thinking of that too, in terms of consistency and allocation. Um, and so with that, full CAS coverage period, let's say as an example for 2018, what happens to previous contracts that were exempt? They remain exempt. If they were modified CAS in a prior period, they remain modified CAS. So, but how do we deal with a non-compliance? Well, if you just had this award, let's just somehow say it happened. You just got an award um, because let's say the prior period finally achieved the 50 million, or let's say better yet, you got a new award on January 1st, that's the beginning of your fiscal year, and it was 50 million. Just happened on January 1st or 2nd, if you want to make it more realistic after the new year. So you haven't even started on it, but you know, somehow, DCA found a CAS 418 non-compliance. Well, in the prior year, all we had was uh, exempt and we had modified CAS. And modified CAS only deals with CAS 401, 2, 5, and 6. So there's no, it's a non-compliance. And DCA, when there's no material impact, they usually just say, we're just putting out a report saying that this is a non-compliance of CAS 418, but there's, it's not material in the map, but we're putting you on notice. For this. Okay. Sorry, I think I went one too fast. Yeah. Okay, if the business unit has full cash coverage in fiscal year, FY18, only the contracts that are full cash cover would be impacted, and that's the point we want to make. So consideration of materiality, if it's not material, DCA will back off and just put you on notice as well. Or the compute, the impact from the date of the non-compliance until the completion of each identified contracts with full cast coverage going out there. And that means that, you know, even into the future. Yeah, into the future. Remember we talked about net awards and it goes as far as those contracts have unexercised options. So this really can have a lot of things. And of course, the computation of a cost impact statement is pretty complicated. There are a lot of roles to it, um, but anyway, it's quite involved. Now, the point I'm trying to make is, what happens if um, we were back to that first example, we said, well, you know, we got a big award that put us over 50 million and we're full cast covered on January 2nd. But ha ha, government, we don't have to do anything because all our contracts that exist that are active besides this one that just started, it's the first day, um, they're either exempt or modified. So ha ha ha, we don't have to do anything. No, DCA could, if there's a real problem with allocability, and as uh, the Steve Meister has reminded me, 
um, basically allocability under the FARs are part of allowability, but basically it's allocability. And you could uh, do something about that. DCA could say, well, we'll make cost adjustments because we see something that's now inallocable as we have unsettled or unopened incurred cost uh, and submissions that are sitting around. We either have unsettled burden rates or we haven't even started your ICE and of course DCA is unfortunately familiar uh, with that. So you can't adjust the firm fixed price. You can only adjust the, the flexibility price or cost reimbursable or the GNA on TNM materials. But uh, it would not also apply to future years because it's just kind of more or less historical. So Steve, do you have anything to say about this? Yeah, I, you're pointing out a, a very important, um, a very important facet of CAS. Is that is that um, CAS applies to a CAS non-compliance will apply to all affected contracts, whether they're open or closed. So we mentioned earlier that it's important to close out your contracts as quickly as you can. But here's an instance where even if you close out the contract, if you failed to uh, follow the standards or follow your uh, cost accounting practices consistently, that contract can still be part of a CAS cost impact. And that's kind of a, that's kind of an onerous thing. Unless it's oh. not material, unless it's not material. Yeah, yeah. Okay, if the business unit had modified CAS coverage in fiscal year 2018, contracts with exempt status would remain exempt. Modified would not be impacted either. Um, oh, excuse me. I will get the front of this. CAS 401. CAS 401 um, is the cost accounting standard. Chris, can you read CAS 401? What's the title of CAS 401? Uh, it's uh, consistency in estimating, estimating accumulating, accumulating, and reporting, and reporting costs. costs. Thank you. We did that in unison. There we go. Okay, so you have to be consistent in estimating, accumulating, reporting costs. So in, in one respect, you can't estimate in greater detail than your officer recording because there's no way for the government to check that. So if a business unit has modified gas coverage in fiscal year 2018, exempt contracts are exempt, but modified contracts would be impacted in that particular um, situation because those four CAS standards are impacted. So again, it depends upon if there's a CAS non-compliance, um, whether you're just totally exempt, whether you have modified, whether you have full CAS coverage, you can see there really has to be an analysis of this. And then after all that, if it's immaterial, DCA will nicely just put you on notice, which is nice. I mean, there's nothing else they can do at this point. So this is how these thresholds impact um, your CAS compliance and your CAS system. And I think at this point, we're gonna turn it over to Steve Shimlian. Shamlian, sorry. Thanks, Paul. We're gonna look at cost accounting standards from, from a 30,000 foot level. Um, ask some fundamental questions about, uh, you know, do you really wanna be a part of this and, and, and be subject to this? Um, and, uh, and provide some answers as to why you, wa why you might want to be or why you might not want to be subject. Um, so some thought questions. How many of you want to have cast covered contracts? I, we've just been talking about some of the, uh, the the onerous requirements of CAS coverage, why would you willingly subject yourself to that? The follow-on question is, how many want to become successful businesses with big government contracts providing, providing goods and services that no one else can provide? CAS coverage is targeted at larger businesses, targeted at larger government contracts, and negotiated contracts. So negotiated contracts will be contracts where there is little or no uh, commerciality. So 
not really a market, not much, not many or, or not any other people that can provide the services or goods that you want to provide. You also have to ask yourself, do I want to continue as a small business? I'm making good money. I have little oversight. And, and answering yes to that question is a valid response. You have to consider, though, that a larger company can come along and, and maybe, maybe uh, win a large contract from your big customer, and that essentially puts you out of that market. So it, sitting tight as a small business, making good money, is not necessarily a safe uh, safe course of action. No, and you know, oftentimes I hear contractors say, well, I gotta just bid on fixed price contracts because I don't want to deal with the regulations. Mm -hmm. It's very myopic in my opinion, it's very small thinking. Mm -hmm. And uh, so the, the answer really, when you look at these questions that you pose here, Steve, uh, I'm gonna say most of the audience I would hope would say, yes, it's all worth it. Yeah. I'll deal with the oversight, I'll deal with the regs mm -hmm. because the end game, and it's 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 actually very attractive. Yeah. Well, we're the regulations themselves, the standards themselves are generally speaking not that bad. They're no. they're they're generally good cost accounting. Exactly, and you know, and when you talk about it, it is accounting at the mm -hmm. end of the day. And there's a lot of generally accepted accounting principles there anyway that you have to sure. adhere to whether you're a contractor or not. Sure, sure. So along those lines, you know, it's it's really. Um, it's just a matter of gearing yourself up for it, being prepared for it, and reaping the benefits. Yep, yep. The, the problem with CAS is what happens to you when you violate it. Well, we can talk about that. That's yep. coming right up. Yep. So getting, your, getting a, CAS, a contract subject to CAS should be a strategic business decision. If you make the decision that you'll – Face the marketing uncertainties of you know, remaining a small business, okay, you made that decision. You know what risks that you have to watch for. You have to watch out for a larger company coming in and, and invading your place in the market. Um, but if you make a decision that you're going to be uh, cash covered, that you're going to go for these bigger contracts, you need to have internal controls to make sure that you can uh, uh, remain compliant. So you have to ask yourself, what could possibly go wrong? And here's some of the things that could go wrong with, uh, if you have a cash-covered contract. You could fail to comply with the standards. Um, you could fail to consistently follow your established cost accounting practice. Note the word established. It's not disclosed, it's established. So if you have a cost accounting practice that you follow, well, you, if you have a cost accounting practice that is established but not disclosed, and you fail to follow that staff, that practice, you you have you have a noncompliance. Okay, you can fail to finally dis, you can fail to timely disclose changes to cost accounting practices. So, if you had a voluntary change and you failed to disclose it timely. The government can call that a um, a non-compliance, and we'll talk about what happens in that case. You can also fail to appropriately represent your level of cash coverage as exempt, modified, or full. Um, and with full coverage, usually comes a requirement to submit a disclosure statement, and that's an important document. And it. Uh, <laughs> It purports to tell what your uh, cost accounting stand, what your cost accounting practices are, and you're required to have a uh, um, your 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 disclosure statement is required to be uh, compliant, and it's uh, re required to be um, it's required to be complete, and uh, and those terms are not really defined. Uh, there's a there was a school of, of thought that a lot of people followed early in my career is that you know let's disclose as little as possible because it gives us flexibility and we can make some changes and and or 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 some 
some modifications that look like changes but really aren't. Uh, and we won't have to deal with the, with the hassle from the government. If that was a valid course of, of, of action back then, I really don't think it's a valid course of action right now. And disclosure statements have um, – there have been some cases that were won because the disclosure statement fully disclosed what the contractor's practice was. Look at the Thiokol um, uh, IRAD case is one, where the contractor said if there is future benefit from this development, then we will uh, uh, allocate that cost to future contracts. Um, and they were able to, won, uh, to, to win their litigation uh, when DCAA would normally say, if you have to develop something in order to comply it w with the terms of a contract, then it is the cost of that contract. So um, also, um, the disclosure statement require, uh, has a question in it, what, uh, requires you to define what your direct costs are. And that definition that the contractor gives there is definitive as to what are direct costs for that contractor. So if the contractor says in its disclosure statement that my direct costs are those costs that are identified with a single cost objective, well, you get some things like, there was an example of a, um, in the packaging area, there was the, a woman who did packaging of the product. And she recorded her, uh, was required to record her time in tenths of an hour, so every six minutes. And so she's actually touching the product, so her work is identifiable with a contract. Every product represents a contract. The problem is that it only took her three minutes to package the product. So her timesheet is going to be long and it's going to be inaccurate. There are some products that are going to be packaged for free. And so it really doesn't make sense to charge that, uh, that woman's time as a direct cost of the uh, contract. And uh, so it would make sense to state somewhere in the disclosure statement in the, uh, under the definition of uh, direct versus indirect that certain costs such as packaging are charged indirect. Very good point. Now, the consequences of failing to um, to comply with these cash requirements are: you can have, you can not have, you can fail to have a contract awarded. So, if your contract requires that you have a cash disclosure statement and you don't have a cash disclosure statement, you don't you don't get the award of that contract. So your first contract in excess of $50 million where a disclosure statement is required, you have to submit a disclosure statement concurrently with that proposal. And if you fail to do that, uh, you, can, you can fail to get fail to win that contract. You can have retroactive price adjustments plus interest, um, and that's for CAS non-compliances. Um, something that I've seen kind of frequently is that the interest on the noncompliance exceeds the amount of the noncompliance because the, uh, 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 the, the cost impact is not settled timely. So the interest just accrues and accrues and accrues yeah. until such time it's settled. So yeah. therefore, the original cost gets exponentially escalated just by virtue of the fact that it goes on and on and on and the interest just keeps accumulating. Yeah. So you had a $1 million cost impact. Five years later, you have a million and a half dollars of interest. Your total uh, cost impact is two and a half million dollars. On a $1 million cost, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so the ability to apply interest is, you know, is, is like a bludgeon in the hands of the, uh, of the government. Um, but even if you don't have a, uh, a non-compliance, you're making a, a voluntary change, 
you have a retroactive price adjustment. Um, it, so we mentioned cost impact. The cost impact is the difference between how you accounted for cost on the contract versus how you should have accounted for the cost on the contract. Um, and cost impacts have to include all affected cash covered contracts and subcontracts regardless of their status. And the status in this uh, case means whether they're open or closed. It includes all affected cash covered contracts and subcontracts regardless of the fiscal year in which the costs were incurred, meaning whether the, or not the final indirect cost rates are established. Um, so in any year where there was a non-compliance, the, the, the cash covered contracts that were affected by this non-compliance are included in the cost impacts uh, calculation. So, for example, um, if I, in my cash disclosure statement, uh, admit a direct cost, mm -hmm. but yet something I didn't think of at the time, I was bidding the contract, but yet it, this this cost that I had overlooked now becomes something that I'm actually uh, reporting. It, it, it wasn't in my estimate, but I'm, I, and I might not be reporting it, uh, but I've got this cost. Mm -hmm. What's going to happen next if I'm billing that cost? That's a good question. It's not necessarily a cast question. That may be a, 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 a bidding question. Well, I would think it would be something in, that would dovetail into 401 in terms of consistency. Yeah. We do, when you talk about reporting, mm -hmm. obviously that can mean a, a number of things. You know, it could be internal reporting, your job status reports, but it also could flow right through to your billings as well. So, so if you have a cost that you did account for, that you accounted for in the past as an indirect, and now you're going to account for it as a direct. The opposite of what we just talked about with yeah. the time entries, yes, for yeah. packaging, right? So you've got this new direct cost, and you want to bill it on this cash-covered contract that was estimated using other cost accounting practices. Indirect versus direct. Yeah. So you that cost that contract would be part of your cost impact for that cost accounting practice change. So the real deal is the, the the final outcome of that would be is there is a cost that now I can identify as a direct cost. Mm -hmm. I'm going to record it as a direct cost, but it's not going to be something that's going to be billable. Is that how you'd handle it? It would be a direct non-billable cost, and therefore would you be okay with not having that in your original cash disclosure statement? Let's – there's a number of ways this can apply. Let, let, let me Let me – let me choose some facts so that I can to fit my answer to them. Okay. Um, situation one, you have a, a, a cost that either is a new cost or was immaterial in the past. Yes. Okay. And the, uh, the incurrence of a new or formerly immaterial cost is not a cost accounting practice change. So let's say you had a an allowable tax from a foreign government and you have um, you've never done foreign work before and now you have a US government contract that requires you to perform in a foreign country and be subject to this tax value added tax value, value added tax you were never subject to it before but right. now you are there you go. as a result of performing on this contract Good example. Okay? And so should you charge this direct or indirect? Well, that's up to you. It should do it whatever way makes sense for your business. Let's say you charge it direct. You should bid this cost in your contract as a direct cost. Going forward. Going forward. So when the contract is awarded, it's a direct cost. Um, but the creation of this new Cost or being the, the, the sub being sub become subject to this new type of cost is not a cost accounting practice change. Good point. Okay. So the the impact is nothing. The, the impact is nothing. Yeah. Okay. Um, if you have a 
if you have a cost that you've been incurred, let's say you have a, you historically charge um, um, program management as an indirect cost because your program managers all handle multiple contracts mm -hmm. and it's just too hard for them to charge their cost or their time directly. Right. Um, you know, think about a bunch of program managers sitting in the uh, program review meetings and, and everyone has 10 contracts and they sit in the meeting for an hour. How are they going to charge their time direct? Okay. Um, so you're charging um, program management as an indirect cost. And then you get this big contract that requires a full-time program manager. And in fact, there's a CLIN for program management and a requirement that you have program management. And so, hey, the government's going to pay for it, right? I'm going to bill that direct. Well, not so fast. Your practice, your established practices are that you charge it indirect. Mm -hmm. So you can do, you know, a number of things, right? Is this new contract, does this new contract reflect a new way of doing business? Okay. A completely different, um, a, a completely different line of product or service. You may uh, uh, create a, a different business unit that has different cost accounting practices, yes. including charging uh, the uh, program management as a direct cost. Mm -hmm. You may want to, um, you may want to change your cost accounting practice in your current division, your, your current business unit, so that um, they're all going to be charged as direct cost. I don't think that makes sense, given the facts uh, situation that we've just given. Every, all the other project managers have uh, 10 contracts that they're doing, and we're going to change the cost accounting practice for one contract? No, that doesn't make sense. If you did it, there would be a cost impact associated with that, and, and it wouldn't make business sense. Does that fully answer your question? Oh, it certainly does, and uh, thank you for taking some time out just to kind of uh, crystallize that for you, mm -hmm. me and the audience. Thanks. Something to notice in that explanation was the comment, it wouldn't make business sense. Your cost accounting practices should make business sense for your business unit. Okay. If you have a cost that, well, like the example of the uh, program managers with 10 contracts each, right. or the packaging person who spends three minutes instead of, it, instead of, it records their time in six minute intervals. Right. Yeah. yeah, those things should probably charge, uh, it makes business sense to charge them indirect, and cost accounting standards allow for you to do that. Very good. Okay. So cost impacts are a big deal. They're hard to uh, compute. Yeah. They're expensive to compute. And they're retroactive price adjustments, things that you were not anticipating uh, incurring. They're, and they deal with cost allocations, uh, which are going to be big issues. So what makes increased cost to the government? On flexibly priced contracts, if the estimated cost or the, uh, or the cost accumulated using the change practice exceeds the estimated cost to complete using the current practice, so in other words, you're going to incur more cost on this contract as a result of the change in cost accounting practice, that's increased, to the, that's increased cost to the government. And that makes sense. Increased cost on the contract is increased cost to the government. Okay, so for for flexibly priced contracts. On the other hand, fixed price contracts. Well, the assumption when you made the price was that this is how much it was going to cost. Okay, you made a uh, you made a established a price based upon how much the estimated cost of that good or service was going to be. Now you've changed your cost accounting practice and. That and the cost of that good or service is going to be less. 
So the government says, I could have paid a smaller price. Instead, I'm paying increased cost because of this reduction in cost on a fixed price contract. So this is in, so the estimated cost to complete or cost accrued using the change practice is less than the estimated cost to complete using the current practice. Okay? Got it. Um, going back to that, there's the requirement to the is that the government will not pay increased cost in the aggregate. And saying, if the government says, if I pay more on cost type contracts and less on fixed price contract, both of those situations are increased cost to me, the government, I get, I get it both ways. And contractors need to be aware that yes, the government might be getting it both ways and they need to be um, prepared to fight that. And that is a difficult fight. So if you decide that, wow, this cast is just too hard for me and, uh, and, and I can be a good, safe, small contractor, not subject to, to cast and, and live a happy and prosperous life, uh, here's what you need to do to avoid the consequences of it. You need to enter into contracts that are not based on cost. It's sealed bid, prices set by law or regulation, Commercial item, note that you can also have a commercial item time and material or labor hour contract, or fixed price that are uh, competitively awarded without cost or pricing data. And you should note here that the contracting officer may demand cost or pricing data, even when there is you know, some, some level of comp competition that is either achieved or anticipated to have been achieved. So it's, it's and typically there's going to be a price threshold associated with that as well. Yeah. So, yeah. so price not based on cost or a price based on government policy. Uh, so it's government policy that foreign governments not be subject to all the CAS standards. So, um, if a foreign government contracts with the United States, uh, they will be subject to, at the most, CAS 401, CAS 402 compliance. And then there's, then there's this um, odd NATO PHM ship, which is just a, which is a one-off. Um, I actually met one person who knew what the PHM ship was and had worked on it in my 35 year career. So not going to apply to most people, huh? Yeah. In fact, uh, you met another person that doesn't know anything about it. <laughs> it's a type of, uh, type of hydrofoil. Oh, okay. So, so there you go. See, I learned something there. Thank you, Steve. <laughs> okay. And also small contracts, contracts with a small business or below the thresholds that we've just talked about. And so um, the thresholds, contracts less than $7.5 million prior to the award of a cast covered contract uh, of, of at least, um, let's, let's, contracts less than $750,000 prior to the award of a cast covered contract of at least $7.5 million. We can fix that typo. Yes, we'll fix that typo. Um, so after the award of that seven and a half million dollar trigger contract, then contracts that are negotiated contracts based on cost of in excess of seven and a half seven hundred fifty thousand dollars are subject to CAS, and they'll be subject to modified CAS. Contracts greater than $750,000 after the award of the trigger contract. Or full CAS upon the award of a CAS covered contract of at least $50 million. Or 
in the year following $50 million in cash-covered awards. Okay. So, so just because you're uh, um, working along and you, you're, you're avoiding a $50 million award, well, if you're doing a lot of cash-covered businesses below that threshold, you may get ca full cash coverage because you had more than 50 million awards in awards in the prior year. Great. Thanks, Steve. So we're now in our last polling question. And our question is, considering only the thresholds, how large does a contractor have to be to have cast-covered contracts? Is it A, only the Lockheed Martins, Northrop Grumman's, et cetera, of the world? B, significant contractors with at least 100 million of annual sales? C, contractors that are smaller than the regulators thought? Or D, all of the above? So please take a moment now to answer. While everybody's recording their answers, I'll provide the third and final CPE word. Our third CPE word is government, G-O-V-E-R-N-M-E-N-T. Again, the final CPE word is government, G-O-V-E-R-N-M-E-N-T. Okay. Yeah, you know, it's just kind of a kind of a tricky question. And and everybody got right that it doesn't apply to only the Lockheed Martin and Northrop Grumman's of the world. Um, those who uh, base their decision on sales, you know, it's, it, cash coverage is not based on sales. So, um, um, and contracts that are smaller than what the regulators thought. That's really the right answer. It, the, the regulators were thinking that this should apply to large companies. Um, and if you think about you know, life as a small company, your, the nature of your business can change depending upon the nature of the work that you win. Right? If you provide um, construction consulting services, that's fine. You're, you're a service provider and you work uh, – uh, and you have a good relationship with your your customer, and you're toddling along doing service contracts. And, if, and your customer says, "Hey, you provide good advice. Why don't you do the contract? Why don't you do the construction?" Sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. And now you've gone from getting these little service contracts to getting this great big construction contract. And your cost accounting practices are going to change. You're not providing services anymore. You're providing construction. Okay? You're going to do, well, where as a service provider, you may not have done any kind of subcontracting at all. And as a construction contractor, subcontracting has now become a major part of your business. So, um, yeah, so... Uh, Requiring you to be consistent when you don't know what the nature of your business is going to be is kind of unfair. And I think they recognize that when they put cost accounting standards together. But over the course of time, this thought process has, you know, been, been overcome by events. And uh, CAS coverage now applies to some contractors that are you know, in, in my opinion, distressingly small. Uh, and so these small contractors are going to find themselves making cost accounting practice changes because the nature of their business is changing and have to prepare expensive cost accounting, uh, uh, cost impact reports to the government. It's, uh, yeah, I... I don't think it's what the original um, intent intent of the, yeah. the cast was. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, you can either avoid cast covered contracts or you can be compliant. 
Okay, and the fundamental concepts that uh, uh, the standards are based upon are the standard, uh, the concept of consistency. So cost accounting practices should be followed consistently. What's a cost accounting practice? Cost accounting practice measures costs or assigns costs to cost accounting periods or allocates costs to cost objectives and think of both direct and indirect uh, cost allocations. Okay, Is it the way your organization chart looks? If I change the way my, if I have a an HR department that's in GNA, and I have a separate recruiting department that's also in GNA, and I combine combine them into one department. Have I made a cost accounting practice change? Possibly. Well, if they're both still in GNA, well, what if you set them up as as service centers essentially within GNA? They become along with IT. In other words, rather than uh, you know having the costs mm-hmm. that are allocated distort, mm-hmm. you know, because you're going to have the executive salaries, all the salaries can be mixed in for HR, mm-hmm. IT, and so yeah. forth. Uh, sometimes we see a practice where they get um, they're essentially part of GNA, but they get an allocation that's mm-hmm. based upon headcount or something along those lines. Now, is that a change to your cost accounting practices mm-hmm. because you're becoming, in a sense, uh, you're, you're actually representing the cost of those departments yeah. more granularly and more fairly. So, so if you have an HR department that's a part of the GNA pool, mm-hmm. and you have a um, recruiting. a recruiting department. That's allocated to GNA and overhead based upon, let's say, number of recruits, right? Um, and then you di- then you combine those and you have them both in the GNA pool. Mm-hmm. You've changed your cost accounting practice from allocating the recruiting department based on headcount yeah, to allocating the re- recruiting function. Over the GNA base, and that's a cost accounting practice change. Uh, if the both organizations were in GNA mm-hmm. and stayed in GNA, and the cost of the both organizations stayed in GNA, then it would not be a cost accounting practice change because there's no difference in al- cost allocation. Okay, it's just an organizational change. Um, but this is a discussion that DCAA would would force you to have. Okay, we see a difference in the way your organization is, is structured. Explain to me how that's not a cost accounting practice change. Okay? And so you need to be able to... Uh, to defend yourself. Hire defend. somebody like Steve or Paul to come on in and there you go. keep DCAA at bay. That's right. Yeah, I worked with this... Uh, with this... Uh, uh, controller at a large organization is a is a billion dollar organization, and he was one of the smartest controllers I think I've ever come across. And DCAA asked a, an open ended question: Why is this account in this cost pool? Mm-hmm. And I know you're supposed to, as an auditor you're supposed to ask open ended questions, but this just seemed to be a little too open ended to me, and so I did an experiment. I said, you know, I'm going to ask it just like DCAA asked it, and let's see the response from this guy. Okay? So I asked him, you know, why is this account included in this cost pool? And it was like his face was the mirror of his soul, right? You could all you could read what he was thinking in his face, right? And his first thought appeared to be, I have no idea. That happened five years ago. And and then then a a moment of terror, if I don't give him a good answer, he'll think I'm an idiot. And then he grasped onto, I've just been working with with revenue recognition. I'll tell him about revenue recognition. And he launches into this speech about revenue recognition and how this, including this account in this cost pool, benefits revenue recognition. I said, stop. When's the last time you thought about this? He says, well, about five years ago when we put these pools together. 
did you make a memo explaining why the costs were in the cost pool? He says, yeah, we did. What a note to the listeners, what a good practice that was. Yeah. Okay? And I said, how long is it going to take you to find that memo and read it over and be able to answer my question? Can you do that by 3 o'clock this afternoon? He says, yeah, I can do that. I left, came back at 3 o'clock, and this guy started talking to me about homogeneous cost pools and uh, over causal or beneficial allocation basis, which is exactly the right answer. Well, there you go. Yeah. So a cost accounting practice measures cost, assigns cost to cost accounting periods, or allocates cost to cost objectives. It's not how your organization is structured. Okay. Um, Um, another fundamental uh, concept associated with cost accounting stat uh, standards are allocation of costs are based on a causal or beneficial relationship of the cost to the cost objectives. So you can group homogeneous costs into cost pools and allocate those over a causal or beneficial relationship, or, or, or a base that bears a causal or beneficial relationship with the cost. So what, what are homogeneous costs? And costs that support the activity over, over which they are um, they're allocated is an example. There, um, the the definition is costs that bear the same causal or beneficial relationship to all the elements of the cost pool. So if you have if you have a manufacturing overhead. The cost and it, that manufacturing overhead pool is allocated over manufacturing direct labor dollars. Makes sense. Okay. So a lot of manufacturers have such such an overhead. Absolutely. What should be in the, that cost pool? Should be materials. Okay. Uh, yeah. You know. What should be the nature of the cost that are in that cost pool? Anything associated with the manufacturing process. There you go. Correct. Yeah. There you go. Things that support the manufacturing process. Yeah. Things like uh, supervision of, of direct labor. Right. Depreciation of the machines that are used. Purchasing. Purchasing can be in there. Receiving. There you go. Yeah. Um, the facilities. Right. Okay. And you think, a, a lot of times you think that a in order for a cost to have a relationship with an allocation base, it has to fluctuate as that base fluctuates. Right. And that's just not the case. Um, you have depreciation on facilities and, and, and assets. And, uh, you know, anything that you could uh, yeah. not necessarily identify to the contract, but identify to the function, those yes. would be in your pool. Exactly. So the allocation of costs are based on a causal or beneficial relationship. Uh, of the cost to the cost objectives. So, if I have manu manufacturing, and my manufacturing labor is in the overhead base, mm -hmm. the costs that I have in that pool are the cost to support those items in the base. Okay. And that brings us to just a few last illustrations of yep. the uh, of the different CAS standards. So. Yep. Well, let's let's hit one more fundamental concept, and that is that the enterprise will continue forever. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of an arbitrary one, but sure. you know what else are you going to do, right? Right. And uh, and that means that your uh, your fixed asset life is going to be the life over which that asset can be economically used. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, yeah, let's just conclude with a few illustrations for the audience. Yes. So, standards that relate to homogeneity are uh, uh, CAS 403, standard cost, allocation of G&A expenses, material direct and indirect cost, CAS 418. Uh, consistency is uh, the consistency standards, CAS 401, 402, and 405, estimating uh, accumulating and reporting costs, allocating costs incurred for the same purpose, 
and accounting for unallowable costs. The uh, accounting for unallowable cost uh, is a consistency standard because if you have a cost that is normally accounted for as, say, a direct cost, and you do that same type of effort, but it's not within the scope of a contract. So it's not an allowable cost on any contract. It doesn't, you cannot account for that cost as say an unallowable G&A pool cost. It's a direct cost. It remains a direct cost. It remains included in whatever uh, allocation base is applicable, you know, th that those types of costs are included in. Consistency. Yep. And illustration of uh, standards that relate to the continuity of the enterprise, depreciation of capital assets, cost accounting period, um, certain compensation and deferred costs, like uh, uh, including pension. Uh, so your uh, so gains and losses on your uh, pension plan assets are going to be amortized over a long period of time. Okay. Homogeneity. And. Um, so what will happen if you're cast coverage? Well, good things that will happen, you'll be in a better position to win larger contracts for goods and services only you can provide. The bad thing that will happen as a result of cast coverage is you're going to have increased compliance costs. These are, these are not easy things, and, uh, it, and you need some good, uh, uh, competent uh, instruction as to how to set up your cost accounting system and your, your practices. And if you uh, violate uh, a standard or fail to follow consistently a practice, you're going to have an expensive cost impact. And the ugly is you're going to have increased government oversight. Yeah, so with that, uh, we'll move on to some questions. Actually, we have one little talking point just to finish up. Strategic decision. Um, so, about so, yeah, so circling back, yeah. CAS coverage should be a strategic uh, uh, decision. When you're getting into the neighborhood of, of uh, acquiring a, CAS, a contract that could be CAS covered, you need to anticipate uh, or avoid coverage by knowing the exemptions and thresholds. You need to follow concepts that are applicable to your business. So just because everybody else has a particular type of overhead rate doesn't mean that you should have one, okay? If, if you have, if you're a, a manufacturer and uh, all your manufacturing is machine driven, right? You, you, it, it's a highly automated manufacturing process. You probably shouldn't have a labor, uh, a, a manufacturing overhead that has a labor base. You probably should look at machine hours, hours or yeah. some, some kind of yeah, labor base that's tied to the machine because that's the nature of your business. Okay. And you also need to have internal controls to document your cost accounting practices and make sure that those practices are followed consistently. Okay. And internal controls are mentioned throughout all the MRDs and in the regs, so uh, that's a topic for another time. So we're going to get to some questions here now. So I've been... I, you know, I was going to cover uh, CAS 419, but we ran out of time here today, so I won't be able to get to that. But all right, uh, question is um, the TINA threshold, and this actually is a kind of a question and a statement. The TINA threshold was increased from 750,000 to 2 million. Yeah, they're tied together. Okay. Yeah. So CAS is going to be whatever the TINA threshold is. Fair enough. Uh, coming along, uh, what is the difference between? But but, but, it, but it's not reflected in DCAA's um, um, uh, flowchart that we included in the standard. Well, fair enough. Hopefully that answers the question for the audience. Uh, what is the difference between modified cast and full cast? Is it just the dollar threshold? Um, it's the dollar threshold. 
Um, the, the, the difference in coverage is what standards that are, are applicable to the, the contract and, um, and what level of disclosure the contractor has to make to its, uh, with regard to its cost accounting practice. So modified cast covered contract is if you have one modified cast covered contract and that's the extent of your cast coverage, you're not going to have to make a disclosure statement. If you have one fully cast covered contract, say it's a $50 million one, you're going to have to make, uh, you're going to have to have a disclosure statement. Which actually uh, answers the next question. Uh, when is a cast disclosure statement absolutely required? $50 million contract. $50 million contract the award itself. So um, we're going to go ahead and kick it back to Yev in a few uh, moments that we have left to go ahead and close things out. Sure. Thanks, Chris. And just a quick reminder, if you have any other additional questions after today's webinar, please reach out to us. Our contact information is listed here. But other than that, with that, we'd just like to thank everyone for attending today's webinar. As always, we encourage you to check our website for upcoming events and updates at www.grfcpa.com slash resources slash webinars. And just one final reminder to please remember to complete the emailed survey that follows if you'd like to earn CPE credit for attending today's webinar. As always, we thank you for attending and we wish you a great day. Thank you.